to you. You talked a little bit about it in your opening remarks, but what was the impact to you of having um, a Rasa teacher? What, what was that like? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tried to say that at the beginning, that it was the first one outside of the language department, so I was just fascinated how had this man succeeded in in getting that kind of an education when such few of people that looked like him had been able to succeed. And at the time I wasn't even aware uh, of who the others were. I, I just, I had lived in a small world <laughs> and didn't know this. Um, but as he talked, he talked about other people that were involved in La Causa, you know, and uh, felt very strongly. So I identified with him um, that I felt that here's somebody that looks like me and he made it. And up to then I had a master's degree and I just didn't think I was smart enough to go on for a PhD, you know. And, and the, the atmosphere that he provided, now he was the only Rasa that was working there, uh, the others were very serious linguists and you know and here we were having we were learning all this stuff and having fun in the evening you know it just created a different thing so I just identified with him and I thought oh man what I wouldn't do to to do something like he's doing you know just opening doors right and left and so and so knowledgeable and didn't take himself, he was serious, but didn't take himself seriously because he'd poke fun of himself, you know, and that was fun. But I really identified with him. And do you remember any stories of discrimination that he told? I guess not in particular. I know that he told us many. I know that a lot of them that he told us was because he was dark skin that they'd think he was almost black and things would be said that that he knew it was for him and then when he'd say he was he was um, Mexicano I think he'd call himself I don't remember when we were speaking Spanish I think at that time we'd always refer to ourselves as Mexicanos when we were talking in Spanish and that that would be a surprise for a lot of people um, I think he I don't remember exactly, but I think he told us about when he was researching for his book uh, that he'd go into the Spanish-speaking places and there, well, he was accepted one of them, but then when he'd start writing about it, people would start questioning because now it was people that didn't understand where, where he was getting his information and how he viewed things. Mm -hmm. So that, I remember that being a, a part of... Uh, of the discussions, but this was so long ago, it was in 64.
I first met Julian Samora, a famous sociologist, in 1964. Um, I had been, I was an elementary school teacher, first grade school teacher, and I had just moved from Las Vegas, New Mexico to Albuquerque. I had come to the big city and I had won uh, a scholarship to go and study in UCLA for one, one summer before I was to take my job in Albuquerque. So I, I went with great anticipation. I had never been to a university outside of New Mexico, so it was very exciting. And there were, I think, six of us from New Mexico or maybe even a few more. And off we went to UCLA in uh, I had had one Spanish-speaking professor at New Mexico Highlands University who uh, had worked with me in Spanish, but I had never had a content area other than my language experience with a Spanish-speaking professor. So we got there and uh, there was, you know, the registration, the excitement of being on this beautiful campus and stuff, and the following day we went to meet our professors. And there was this famous person, Dr. Julian Samora, that I had heard a little bit about, but not a whole lot. I knew that he had written a book about Spanish Americans, and I knew that he taught in the East Coast, and that's about all I knew about him. But it was just a wonderful experience. He was, um, he had a great sense of humor, so he was funny. Um, and kept us all involved, but he also had a very serious side that he meant business, and and I love that. I'm a workaholic, and I thought, aha, here's one like me, you know, uh, we're going to read this, and we're going to read that, and, and he started talking about Mexican Americans in a way that I really hadn't heard talked about in open sessions. It's the way we talked about ourselves and how we'd been put down by others, but we really, did, in New Mexico, we really didn't talk about it uh, openly back then. You know, we've gotten very vocal now. And what was the content area of this class? Yeah, uh, we took um, sociology of Mexican Americans, so it was pinpointed to uh, to the study of Mexican Americans in the context of the greater uh, society. And so he talked about the discrimination and discrimination that he had gone through because he was very dark skinned, things that had happened to him. And, and so I kept identifying with him, you know, just right away. And then um, uh, he started, he and his wife, Betty, started inviting us to their home at, in the, we'd go in the evening, and <clears throat> that too was new for me. I hadn't spent much time in professors' homes, and we would go, and um, they'd serve wine and cheese and crackers, and we'd sit around and just talk and talk, and he would tell us uh, lots of things that that added to the lectures that, you know, made it come alive. But something interesting was that um, Betty chimed in as though she were unequal to him. And I kept thinking, she's not a professor. You know, she's not a professor. He's the professor. And yet, she, anything he said, she'd chime in or she'd ask a question, and I'd think, I've never seen anything like this. Well, the more we went through this, I loved it, you know. I think that was sort of women's lib. She was coming up too, you know. That, uh, then I realized they were really a team. They, they, she knew probably just as much as he did about what he was working on. So it was really a, a, a team effort and a very exciting time. So that's how I met Julian Samora and Betty. Oh, thank you.